what it is, Donnie, is fear. It's just fear. It's these people see the world changing and they're just scared. We're all scared of change. Nobody likes change. Everyone wants everything nice and calm, just the way it is. I got the room just the way I like it. Leave it alone. Stop redecorating. <laughs> but, but the world doesn't work that way. The world is constantly changing. And politics constantly change. And social issues constantly change. Welcome to On Brand with Donnie Deutsch. I'm Donnie Deutsch, and this is On Brand. And this is the one podcast dedicated, the only podcast dedicated to the simple premise that everything and everybody is a brand. Every company, every product, every celebrity, every athlete, every political party, every politician, uh, all brands. A brand is a set of values. Your brand, if you have a Facebook page and you portray yourself with images and words because you're putting your brand out there. And we do two things on the show. Um, first, we do a big interview uh, with a big personal brand. And today, I am thrilled to Harvey Firestein. He is one of the faces of Broadway. Uh, he's got a new memoir out that is just fantastic. He's in the middle of remaking Funny Girl on Broadway, uh, which hasn't been done in 50 years. He's got incredible stories. He's a thoughtful guy. Uh, He's been a gay activist, uh, and he's 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 just fantastic, and you're going to love this interview. We also do what we call our brands of the week, and these uh, we follow the zeitgeist and which brands are up and which are down, who's driving, what's going on in the world. So let's get right to our brands of the week. First up, brand down for right wing populism. Uh, look, you had Le Pen who lost in in France, lost bigly as Trump would say by 16 points. You got Trump who lost the last election, lost the election before that as far as the midterms. Um, you've got Putin failing on the on the on the um, uh, global stage. You've got the new prime minister, the Liberal Party, ousting the right wing conservative uh, populist uh, party in Slovenia. Uh, the year two thousand twenty one started with seventeen uh, right wing populist running countries. Now we're down to twelve. So everybody's been hysterical about the end of. Uh, end of democracy. And throughout time, democracy tends to win out and it's winning today and, and right wing. So big brand down for right wing populism. Big brand down for big tech. Uh, big news here. The EU, um, European Union, just passed what's called the Digital Services Act. And this is going to add a lot of transparency. And the West is going to, over here, we're going to pick it up because so we're going to see it. A lot of transparency to the, to the, to the uh, Facebooks and the Googles uh, in terms of their algorithms. And the algorithms are kind of the, the dirty little laundry that they don't like to air because that's where it kind of multiplies engagement in very negative terms. So, for instance, if somebody is, you know, wants to find out, is watching misinformation, it breeds more misinformation, it takes them down the rabbit hole of, uh, of bad stuff, if you will. Also, they're not going to let advertisers target by race or religion or sexual orientation uh, and profile that way. So, a lot of transparency coming out of this new Digital Services Act out of the EU, and I think it's going to have tremendous, tremendous applications in the United States. Something's got to give. Something's got to give with these social media companies. Unregulated uh, in ways that ABC is not unregulated, the Wall Street Journal is not unregulated, and they are media platforms. They need to be regulated to some degree. Brand up for advertising. Yes, Netflix crashed last week. Their stock dropped 30%. Their subscriber base is off. And one of the things that's been thrown out there is they might start taking advertising. And I find it interesting that advertising, always you have these platforms that come on and no advertising, okay? Netflix, you know, we, you sign up your subscription models, you don't have advertising. And eventually advertising always seeps in because it's a revenue stream that just people can't turn away from. And I advertising is, the business is way up this year. Advertising revenues for ad agencies we're up 13% year over year. But what I find interesting is, and this is a contradiction, this is a brand down for advertising, is that it seems to be less part of the popular culture. Uh, it used to be that ads were talked about a lot. And yes, we talk about them in the Super Bowl, but they climb into the popular culture, whether it's a where's the beef or whatnot, or what's up. And I think it's because television advertising and television is such a smaller part of the overall media landscape. And yes, people watch them on phones, ads, and, and we, we, we see them on, on our computers, but I don't know if it's the same thing. But so as advertising grows and its impact grows, its cultural relevance does not seem to be growing in concerts. That's very, very interesting. Brand up for men. I had to do this uh, in response to Tucker Carlson, 
who's got a special on the, the I think it's called the death of men or whatever happened to manhood or something. His whole premise that, that the left wing is, is killing men in America and that there's things that men need to do to get their testosterone up. And he, he had an example on the show. This is real, by the way, that men should use um, infrared light on their testicles to increase their testosterone. I'm going to pass on that one. But I'm going to say it's a brand now because it's interesting. A GQ study uh, a year or two ago, they basically said that um, 48% of men are comfortable with new roles versus 27% uncomfortable. 78% feels childcare should be shared. So I think men are evolving with these roles. And, I, and I, you know, Tucker Carlson and the far right don't want to see, you know, uh, anything change as far as men's roles in our world. And like everything, everything evolves and changes. And so I'm going to give a brand up for men. And as always, a huge brand down for Tucker Carlson. Brand up for job switchers. Um, this is interesting. Zip Recruiting Survey in the Wall Street Journal uh, had a study that was 25 to 54 year olds, 46% said they're going to be leaving a job in the next two years. That's incredible. You know, the affiliation with companies, the loyalty, that game is over. And one of the reasons is wages, wages are exploding. 10% of people think they're are going to leave for a 50% wage increase. And that's one of the reasons we have inflation now. Obviously, higher wages are good, but when wages start to really get out of whack, it actually hurts the economy and it, it makes for the inflation that we're having now. But the big story here is just, the, no, and not a surprise, is the lack of loyalty to people, to corporations now. Obviously, all institutions are in play, but it seems as if the days of uh, aligning with a company are over. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. A brand up, unfortunately, for Ron DeSantis. Uh, I find him scary. Uh, I talked last week about how he was taking on Disney. And I actually believe he, he's going to be the next Republican candidate, not Trump. I think he's going to run against Trump. And I think he's got, because right now people, I think, are still into Trumpism, but they realize that Trump is a losing proposition. And that's the way he'll run. He'll run, say, look, I stand, Trump and I stand, you know, together on all the issues, except he lost and he's going to lose again and I can win. And he's a more digestible form of Trump. And, and he's equally scary as Trump, frankly, but he comes in a more palpable package. And that's why I find him so frightening to the Democrats. So I have to begrudgingly give him a brand up because he's he's gaining in popularity and he's Trumpism without Trump. And that's what the Republican Party wants. Brand down for Mark Meadows. This is a former chief of staff who, in an interview um, with CNN's Jake Tapper, this is going back a year or so, says... I don't want my vote or anyone else's to be disenfranchised. Do you realize how inaccurate the voter rolls are with people just moving around? Anytime you move, you'll change your driver's license, but you don't call up and say, hey, by the way, I'm re-registering. Oh, and by the way, he, was, as of last week, was registered in three states to vote. So there you go. Once again, the, hypocr the hypocrisy of the Republican Party. Brand um, down for Madison Cawthorn, one of the right-wing zealot nuts out there. And of course, he's been against transgender rights. And guess what? Picture surfaced of him last week from a party wearing women's women's clothing and earrings and women hoop earrings. He said it was just dressing up for a party. I'm sure he was. But, you know, I just love these righteous guys and, and anything that has to do with blurring of sexuality or genders. Yet here he is dressing up like a lady at a party. There you go, Madison Cawthorn. Brand up for Michael Cohen, my friend. You know, basically huge brand down for uh, District Attorney Bragg of New York, who seems to be walking away from any indictments on Trump when... Uh, his two top prosecutors said they have enough to get him for whatever reason he's walking away. And Michael, who's sat with them for dozens and dozens and dozens of hours, says, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. If you guys decide you want to do it like I've sat, I've given up beyond going to jail. I've given up weeks of hours of my life. And he's saying, I'm done. I'm not, you guys are not indicting. You don't get me. So there you go for Michael Cohn. Brand down for Texas Governor Greg Abbott. This is amazing. He um, had initially uh, increased inspections of commercial trucks entering from Mexico, and it resulted in zero migrants detained or illegal drug seizures. They spent $4.3 billion on these new enhanced trucks in inspections, yet they did not catch a single illegal alien or confiscated a single gram of illegal drugs. So $4.3 billion of the taxpayers' money, new commercial uh, uh, you know, uh, interrogations of vehicles has not turned over. Um, just amazing. And their response is, however, Governor Abbott successfully persuaded Mexico states to enhance security on their side of the border. Both of these things are true at the same time. So, yeah, I guess that's why they didn't come in because there's more security on the other end of the border. So, uh, that, another, another great Republican politician at work. Brand now for Starbucks. I love Howard Schultz, who's, who's returned to run Starbucks. They have an interesting kind of uh, 
contradiction going on here. They just came off record earnings year, the second highest ever, $4.2 billion. But the shares have fallen 32% in the last 12 months. And a lot of it has to do with uh, customers get about 70% of the orders to go, bypassing the spaces in the company where people would sit around and they buy more stuff. And that's post-pandemic stuff. You know, people are not hanging around Starbucks as much anymore. So even though there's, their sales are up, uh, the prognostications for Starbucks, Starbucks are not as strong. And therefore, the brand is in a little bit of flux. Unfortunately, a brand that for CNN+. Plus. Uh, CNN Plus, which was CNN streaming service, was uh, much ballyhooed uh, since it was, or since it was announced and in development. CNN merged uh, CNN's parent company, Warner, uh, merged with Discovery, new Warner Brothers Discovery, and uh, David Zasloff, the who's a super CEO in charge of that company, realized he not realized has always said we don't do standalone streaming things, and he wants to bundle it into something bigger built around HBO and built around Warner. And I don't think that's the wrong strategy, but it's an example of just mismanagement. You know, they, this should have never launched. People left. They went for new jobs. Uh, uh, they, they lost $300 million on this thing, and they probably shouldn't have launched. They knew this was coming, but the old regime wanted it to get it out there, and there's politics involved in situations like this. But unfortunately, because a lot of people got caught in the crossfires. So there you go. Brand down for guns. Guess what? Guns were the leading cause of death among U.S. kids in 2020. For the first time in more of a decade, guns were the leading cause among children and adolescents passing traffic accidents, passing, uh, it, it's amazing. They found that more, more than 4,300 individuals between the age of 1 to 19 died across the U.S. as a result of firearms, and that beat the amount of people that died in car accidents. So there you go. Number one killer of young people, guns. Another good, good message for guns there. I say that obviously facetiously. Um, something's got to give. Brand down for the Masked Singer under the guise of really stupid TV shows. It falls to a season-low viewership with Rudy Giuliani unmasking. The episode got a 0.6 demo and only 3.6 million viewers. Viewerships from season seven has been in flux, but the Masked Singer's demo took a hit also going from 1.0 with the seventh season down to a 0.6 a week ago. And Rudy Giuliani, if it couldn't get any lower for him, not only is he part of this stupid show, he's been the lowest rated thing they've done. And this, it's just amazing that what these guys will do to stay in the limelight. A brand up for Mikel Cabrera. Uh, he is only a seventh player to get 3,000 hits and 500 homers. And he's another example of what I, although brand up for him, what's wrong with baseball. Here's a guy that's a generational player that most people don't even know of who aren't close followers of baseball. You've never seen him in an ad. Um, and they have not done a good job of marketing their stars. Here's a guy that basically you put him in a category with only six other players, Aaron, Willie Mays, Pujols, Rodriguez, Eddie Murray, and Rafael Palmeiro. And it's an amazing list, and yet he does not have any of the notoriety of any of those other players, and baseball has not done a good job selling his players. Uh, big brand up for Tyson Fury. Retains his heavyweight title with a TKO of Dylan White, Dillian White. And what I love about this guy, Tyson Fury, is he, he's just great to watch because he's 6'9", he's 2, I think, two, eight, 264 pounds, but he's not built like a boxer. He's built like he's got a dad body. You know, he's got a flabby stomach in it, yet he's this amazing pugilist, and it just gives hope for all of us dad body guys out there. Brand up for smart mirrors. Smart mirrors can guess your size. You go into a clothing store, you stand in front, and why it matters is that 80% of clothing returns are size-related. So this is called the First Look Smart Mirror. It comes from a company called My Size, And I think that's just incredible. Brand up a pickleball. Pickleball keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Rally Entertainment will launch Rally, an urban pickleball and entertainment experience in Charlotte with two buildings over two acres, 27,000 square feet. Pickleball, for those of you who don't know, is a slower version of tennis. It's smaller. It's If you basically still want to play tennis, I'm not saying it's just for older people because it's not, but the ball doesn't go as fast. You don't have to cover as much ground, and it's it's on fire, pickleball. So try pickleball. And finally, a brand down for Captain Obvious. Captain Obvious was Hotels.com pitch person. He was their uh, 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 logo. I don't know if you saw the commercial Captain Obvious, but they're killing Cap, not literally, but they're ending Captain Obvious's run. And that's always interesting for an advertiser when you pour so much money behind a mascot uh, and you that's what you think you're going to build it for life. And then all of a sudden, a new advertising agency comes in and goes, well, guess what? We don't like the mascot. So a brand down for Captain Obvious. Brand down for feet. At the beginning of pandemic, doctors saw a sharp drop-off in foot trauma. But since then, it's increased 
Part of the explanation is the pandemic weight gain, where even an extra couple of pounds makes a disproportionate impact for our feet. Also, now that spring is here, mandates for relaxing, and people are eager to get their pre-pandemic bodies and they're going at it hard. But somehow since the pandemic, people's feet are taking a beating. So brand out for feet, and those are our brands of the week. Now let's get to our interview with Harvey Firestein. You're gonna really, really enjoy this. Sit back and, and have some fun. There it is. There's that sound again. It's another sale on Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. So I'm going to break it down to a simple benefit. If you have anything to sell online, you want Shopify. This, this is the place. It's a platform designed for anyone to sell anywhere, giving entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business, customize your needs with a great-looking online store that brings your idea to life, and tools to manage day-to-day -day and drive sales. Making your idea real opens endless possibilities. Uh, Shopify believes in liberating commerce for all. Entrepreneurship has the power to drive communities forward. Get started by building and customizing your online store with no coding or design experience. Access powerful tools to help you find customers, drive sales, and manage your day-to-day. -day. Gain knowledge and confidence with extensive resources to help you succeed. Plus, with 24-7 support, you're never alone. It's more than a store. Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. So go to shopify.com slash Donnie all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial. Free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Start selling on Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash Donnie right now. Shopify.com slash Donnie. Okay, I want to talk to you about Alto IRA, and that's A-L-T-O. Do you have an account with Coinbase? Are you thinking of opening one? Do you, have, do you own any Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, or any other cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency may represent the future of money, and it's one of the most exciting investment opportunities coming along in a long time. But what about taxes with crypto? When you do anything in life, there's one way to do it, and maybe there's a smarter way. You might already be investing in cryptocurrency, but did you know you can trade Bitcoin, Ethereum, and over 80 cryptocurrencies in a tax advantage IRA? So this is an IRA just set up for trading crypto, and you can save taxes on it. Without the crypto IRA, you can trade crypto like Bitcoin and avoid or defer the taxes. Get into investing in crypto and doing a tax advantage retirement account. Alto's crypto IRA is the easy way to get crypto into an IRA. Create an account in just a few minutes. Invest as little as $10. No setup charges. It's secure trading 24-7 through Alto's integration with Coinbase. 80 plus coins available, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Cardano. And want some sushi swap with your Bitcoin? No problem. Alto has you covered. Industry-leading security, multiple ways to fund your account, make a cash contribution, transfer cash from existing IRAs, or roll over an old 401k. Ready to take your investments to the next level? Diversify like the pros and trade without tax headaches. Open an Alto Crypto IRA with as little as $10. Just go to altoira.com slash brand. That's A-L-T-O-I-R-A dot com slash brand. Start investing in cryptocurrency today. Go to altoira dot com slash brand. I am thrilled with today's guest, the one, the only Harvey Firestein, a legend, a, a multiple Tony winning, Emmy nominated, every award that you can win. He's currently, uh, he's got a huge New York Times bestseller. I was better last night. Who would have thunk uh, that Not me that a, a little Harvey Firestein from Bensonhurst would be a New York Times bestseller? Well, it's I, 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 COVID. COVID. Yeah. COVID is the reason for everything. It's like COVID is the reason for the season. Um, I had cleared my desk. You know, the way we went into lockdown. I cleared my desk. Um, I had nothing to do. So then I, uh, I said, uh, okay, I got out my sewing machine and I made some quilts because people had babies. People got married. I owed a few quilts. I made like five quilts. And I said, what do I do now? And my agent said, have you ever thought about writing your memoir? And I said, I don't write long form. I, you know, it's, and he said, and then I thought, nobody's going to ever see it if it doesn't turn out good. So go ahead and write it. So I did. And uh, bestseller. I, bestseller. I want everybody to go to the Amazon Audible page to hear Harvey's voice, because once you hear it, you're just, you, you're hearing his voice throughout the book. And, and it's just, it, the book is spectacular. There are so many moments in the book. And one that just jumped out at me was your interview with your friend at the time, Bar uh, Barbara Walters. Uh, when and I just this is 1983, and on air I think it was 2020 or one of those shows. She actually said to you, uh, you used the term. She looked at me like I was an alien. What's it like to be a homosexual? And, yeah, 
that was and that I was. Mean, can you imagine asking somebody that like that today on television? And how did how'd you answer that at the time? I, well, I, I, I think you can see if you it's a, the 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 video has been on YouTube for all these years. It's never gone away, um, and people watch it. You can see my eyes just open up, and I'm trying to like look in her eyes, saying, "Where's my friend Barbara? What happened to my friend Barbara? Why is she asking such strange questions?" So I just figured um, she's asking. Let me try and answer as best I could, um, and, and that's what I did. I. Um, and then, I mean, over the years, I've come to realize what that interview has meant to people. It's, uh, she, I mean, she did an unbelievable job when you think about it, because to many people who had never gotten into a conversation like that, it all of a sudden was open and it was real and it was um, not not playing around. It wasn't, you know, it was, and it just it just freed up so many people like I said, it's still it's still there on YouTube after all these years. So I, I I always credit her with doing a fabulous job, though it was very strange to me. Yeah, yeah, strange. Growing up, you grew up in Bensonhurst. Your mom's a librarian. Your dad's a salesman. And you said at age seven, you kind of felt something was was a little different going on with you than, than some of the other kids. Well, in, in PS one eighty PS one eighty six. Do I have that right? PS one eighty six. Yeah. Here's the thing uh, that people. I don't think really think about when you're a kid, uh, when you're a kid and um, you, you feeling out the world. I mean, when you're little and you have no language, you're just feeling out the world. This is where I fit in my family. This is, this is my mother. That's what that looks like. This is my father. That's what look, these are my cousins, whatever. A gay kid um, does that. And then comes to the conclusion of who they are and says, wait a second, this doesn't fit with the rest of the picture that I'm supposed to have here. So a gay kid then goes back and runs all those computations again. And this um, is against the backdrop in the late 50s, 60s, where you don't have it in the media. It doesn't exist. It, exactly, it doesn't but exist. I'm saying, but I'm saying even today, a gay yeah. a kid would do that. Because, I mean, a little kid doesn't have this sort of language, doesn't have any sort of background to do this. And and so any, and that a gay child goes through that over and over and over again, sometimes their entire lives. Some people don't come out until their 70s or 80s years yeah. old. Um, so every gay child um, has been through a, a sort of a self-analysis uh, that a straight kid doesn't. I mean, a straight kid goes, that's my mother, that's my father. I fit in right here and that's fine. And then they go on with their lives. But a gay kid goes through all this other stuff. I was um, one of those uh, really uh, um, undeniable gay kids. I, I, I think in the 50s, they called it artistic. I was <laughs> And flamboyant, and flamboyant. Yeah, a little flamboyant. That you was know, that, I, that was the word. That was the word back then. He he was flamboyant. That was, so that's where people yeah, would say that was, it, right? Well, that was almost sixties. But they, um, when I was little, I mean, I I had a baby doll that I loved, and and you know had a carriage and all that. And the neighbors looked at my mother like she was insane to let a boy play with this stuff. And she she knew she knew um, she allowed it because she knew. Um, my father w was brought up in an orphanage, um, and so family was incredibly important to him. His mother had died in childbirth, and his father put him in an orphanage because he didn't want to raise a baby. And so when he grew up, um, family was everything to him. And the rule in our house was, outside of the house, you are never wrong. In the house, you could be very wrong, right. but outside of this house, we will always take care of you and defend you, and you will never be wrong. And that was the rule. And so that's the way I was raised. I was raised with that kind of as outrageous and flamboyant and whatever else you want to call it. They backed me up. They didn't try and change me. So you talk in the book about going to the High School of Art and Design and how you found folks like you. But how did you deal with feeling different in, in those ages where we we weren't you didn't see it around you didn't know guys like you and you you said that you thought maybe you were you you said you never considered yourself trans but at that time you thought maybe well, you should that you should have been a girl and and so how did how does a young boy deal with manage through that especially in those times? Well, the joke is, and of course this is jumping ahead. Um, many of my friends, my 
my male friends from that age turned out to be gay. Right. <laughs> so I, I wasn't so alone. I wasn't as alone as I thought I was. Um, uh, though I just had I just had lunch with um, with one friend who I haven't seen since our bar mitzvahs. Hey. Um, he became a, a he's the head of a of a of a sect. He uh, Jews for Jesus. Okay. That's, that's, Jews for Jesus. So, so I never understood alter- the whole Jews for Jesus thing. I don't want to get any messy no, letters. All turned out to be gay is the point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us turned out to be Jews for Jesus, but uh, see, there were many choices. Men's and Earth was a was a many splendored thing. Um, well, how did I deal with it? You you deal with you just try. You're constantly trying to figure out where you fit in. I mean, even even straight kids uh, have to figure out where sure. they fit in in their social groups and everything else. So I went to when I arrived at the high school of art and design, which had a lot of gay kids. Um, I was sort of ready to explode, as it were. I, I I sort of I knew lots of stuff, though I didn't have the names to put. I didn't have the plumbing lined up. I didn't know how all yeah. this was going to work, but I sort of knew uh, by then. I skipped two grades, so I ended up in high school at the age of 13. Yeah. Can you believe, so was, can you believe in this day and age, there are almost 300 bills, anti-LGBTQ bills, in going in various states. You don't say gay. Can you imagine that you're a first grade boy or girl, and let's say you have two mommies or two daddies or you you feel that your you know your choices at that age you're starting to feel and it's not allowed to even be discussed you can't like your family I, doesn't exist you're in second I grade if you're 8 that. years old in this in the year 2022 this is why are we going backwards we're not going backwards there are people who are trying to take us backwards, but you know, you and I both know, backwards is impossible. No. It doesn't work. Right. It's, it's it's physically impossible. It's socially impossible. It's politically impossible. You can pass laws and stuff like that, but once rights have been granted, courts don't do so well of taking away people's rights. Um, we're, but we're about to have this battle with, with uh, Roe v. Wade and see how, how that goes. And I think... The thing that makes me crazy is we're going to spend billions of dollars fighting to end up exactly where we are now. Yeah. And that's going to happen also with these 300 bills. What it is, Donnie, is fear. It's just fear. It's these people see the world changing and they're just scared. We're all scared of change. Nobody likes change. Everyone wants everything nice and calm, just the way it is. I got the room just the way I like it. Leave it alone. Stop <laughs> redecorating. But, but the world doesn't work that way. The world is constantly changing. And politics constantly change. And social issues constantly change. When I was a kid, my our whole battle of gay rights was a sexual battle. Ours was homosexual sex is exactly equal to heterosexual sex. There's no difference. It's all the same. It's just sexual activity. Everything's... This generation, now, their battle is on gender, which is fascinating to me. Absolutely fascinating. The the sexual battle has already been, been, been settled for them, and now it's like, what is a man? What is a woman? What is the role? What are we physically? What are we mentally? What are we emotionally? And they're asking all these questions that I don't know. I'm in the middle of it, and I don't know what we're going to end up. What, what, well, I what, mean, is there a, is there a school of thought that it, you, it's sometimes going to be maybe too much of a poo-poo platter, where you, you, there's so you know you're pansexual, you're this, you're that, you're that. Where a kid is it? Where you are we? The answer is no. We can't be too liberal because every everybody's got to be included but it gets to a point where it's just is it almost overwhelming for kids in that there's so many choices today and it, it, it in certain ways it's it's more difficult and obviously we, we it, it's the right place to be but interesting yeah, but it, but that's just it you're, you're feeling exactly what they're feeling you're yeah. feeling it on the liberal side but you're still feeling this thing of i don't know where i am i don't know where my feet I hit the ground I don't yeah. I, I I'm losing I'm losing my place to stand here do I call I, I mean I'm not all that comfortable calling somebody they or them yeah you know I 
I said, so what are we going to do? We're going to change. We're going to change all shows. So it's and, and instead of the boys from Syracuse, it's them from Syracuse. Yeah. It's yeah. Of my fair lady. It's my fair they. Um, but you know what? It's a fun thing to make fun of, but it's a great thing to ask questions about. The bottom line is we are in a new place. We don't know where we're going to end up. We don't know exactly how we're going to land, but um, it's scary, but it's exciting. If life isn't exciting, why bother? And unfortunately, you have people like, I mean, look at somebody like Grassley, a man who hasn't paid a bill since he was 16 years old. Maybe yeah. then he didn't pay a bill. He sat in Congress. He's never had to go to a doctor that wasn't paid for. He hasn't done anything. He doesn't speak to anybody outside of politics. He has no idea what is going on in the world for 80 years. He has no idea. And that's who's running the country. Yeah. We have people that aren't even outdoors. They don't even know how to open a window and ask somebody, a real person, a question. And here you and I are dealing with something as profound as what is a man, what is a woman. It's a huge question I, 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 that, like I said, I'm not totally comfortable with, but I find very exciting. Yeah. And I find I find life exciting that way. Um, on the other hand, it's just trying to find the language can be very difficult. Yeah. Even just the language, even if you want to be inclusive, the language. But imagine you are a kid, like you just said, and you have two fathers at home or two mommies at home, and you come to school and you're told that if you even mention it, your teacher's going to go to jail. I mean, what kind of denial is that? It's frightening. Are they... They think their parents are going to break up because the kid can't say the words in school. I don't, I don't, I don't. Like See, I said, they don't, well, it's interesting. The really defenders matter. of it will say, and, and people will say, well, well, I don't want any sexuality discussed up until third grade. But then you don't think through, wait a second, you, my kid comes to school and draws a picture of his family and he's going to be chagrined somehow. I mean, it's just right. something where I want to go that? back, uh, before we, I don't want to get too deep into politics because I want to tell a little bit more okay. about the Harvey story. So what got you into kind of acting, you know, it was Andy Warhol, actually. It was your, your desire. You, you started Pork when you were 16. Talk to, me about your first, talk to me about your first interactions with Andy. Well, that's, but that's what happened. What happened was I was in art school, and one of the kids said, my mother's starting a community theater. I had no interest in theater. I love theater. I love going to theater, seeing theater. My, my mother bought tickets for the family to see everything. Um, uh, but, but I had no desire to be an actor or a writer or any of that stuff. But um, she was starting a, a community theater. Could we come to the basement of a church and make posters? So we did. And, and then I sort of hung out and, uh, you know, did other fun things, but just thought of it as fun. But I loved Warhol. As an artist, I loved Warhol. Not the pop art stuff yet. I didn't really get His drawing, like yet. his Bloomingdale's drawings, yeah. His Bloomingdale's drawings and all that. And so there was an ad in the paper saying Warhol was doing a play at something called La Mama, which Beves La Mama. Um, <laughs> so I went down there. I made a photo and resume and took my little ass down there, 16 years old, and and um, and found La Mama and auditioned and got into this play. And all of a sudden realized that I was not only in in experimental theater. I was in the middle of this experimental art. I was, everyone downtown was creating this art. It was this underground art movement. And I just fell into it and, and fell in love with it. And, and I was part of the Theater of the Ridiculous and the, the Negro Ensemble Company and, and uh, Theater Genesis, all these theaters, um, plus this art movement. Uh, um, lots of, lots of uh, working artists around me. Um, and, and so I was this nice Jewish boy at home. I, then I was going to college full time. Um, and then I was at night, I was in this movement. It was it was a, a very exciting time in my life. You're when I look at the the, the, the theater that you start in or either written the book of everything from Lacage to Hairspray, Funny Girl, Torch Song Trilogy, which is probably your your raison d'etre, if you will. Um is there a thread that kind of attracts you to certain projects or that, that, that kind of, if I was going to say to you, okay, Harvey, talk to me about your body of work and talk to me about a thread that runs through it. 
What, what would, is there, I mean, can you, I, I know I'm oversimplifying and I can't because no, the world's I'm also different. I'm, I'm attracted to the human story. It's always the human story. Um, it's not, uh, um, uh, sometimes I end up on the really political side, like with a play, like uh, my play, uh, Casa Valentina, mm -hmm. but it started out, my research into that world started out on the human level. Um, I, I just, uh, Theater is just, uh, to me, about people, and it's always uh, about people, and it's always about the connection between the people on stage and then this live audience, because the live audience is part of the performance, not like movies or TV, yeah. where you know that movie just plays, whether the theater is empty or full, it's the exact same movie, but theater isn't. Theater changes with every audience that comes in. So that's what fascinates me about it. It's the interaction. Theater, I think of as um, a, 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 a temple or a church. It's, you know, strangers come in, they don't know each other, and yet they sit next to each other, very close together, and experience something together. They look up at that stage or altar or whatever you want to call it, and everyone believes. If I walk out on an empty stage and say, what a gorgeous day it is here in Bayonne. You and the audience go, okay, we're in Bayonne. Right. You're willing to believe, right? Yeah. You're, you're just like in a church. You're willing to believe if I say Bayonne. But if I'm watching a movie and I say, isn't it beautiful in Bayonne? You go, I don't see Bayonne behind him. Yeah. I always, I always, I always wonder as I'm watching you guys give it your all on stage every night. How do you get up for it every night? And how do you, how do you keep, how do you keep it fresh in your own mind so you're not thinking about your dry cleaning when you, I, I, and I you, I I could see the spilk is coming out on stage and the guts pouring out and I always marvel how do you guys get it up every night what's the formula there? it's 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 technique it's technique a lot of it's technique I mean that's why you rehearse you rehearse to find those places so that. Um, you have your anchors, you have your emotional anchors. You lean very heavily on the other actors with you. Um, you all try and be present together. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes all of a sudden your mind is thinking about, I got to pick up the dry cleaning. Yeah. And then you got to snap yourself back into it. When you're doing a musical, it's a little easier because you have a whole orchestra keeping you there. Yeah. You know, you've got an orchestra saying, Keep up with me, kid, because we're going this way. But in a play, it, it is harder. Um, and it's why some actors don't like doing plays. They don't like doing the exact same thing eight times a week, eight performances a week. It's a hard thing to do, but that's what you sign on to do. But it's, it's, it's I mean, it's a job like any other job. That's yeah. what your job is. Yeah. And you've had a foray into movies, uh, probably most well-known as... Uh, Robin Williams' brother and Mrs. Doubtfire. I know you became friendly with Robin. What's the craft? Do you are you are you using different instruments when you're doing? Because you don't have that audience to play off of now. And somebody who is trained in the theater and lived in the theater and is the theater, how is that experience different for you? Yeah, I don't I don't like making movies and TV as much. It's a lot of sitting around yeah. in your trailer. Um, I find it kind of boring. I, um, uh, on stage, you you have a lot more control. You know what's going on. Once once that curtain goes up, you're in charge. It's not about the camera. It's not about the the lighting. It's not about the the focus of the lens. It's it. You are focusing the lens. You are telling the, the, what what's going on. So I do like theater a lot better, and, and I don't enjoy movies and TV as much. Though I I do do them. Um, I used to do them for the health insurance. <laughs> it used to, be, well, it's true. It used to be you had to do one movie a year to earn enough money to stay on the health insurance. But now that they messed up the health insurance, it's like when they call me to do movies, I go, uh, I just did a, a movie with Billy Eichner uh, as a favor because he wanted an all gay cast, even in the heterosexual roles. Okay. So, uh, so I said, I can't turn Billy Eichner down. So I did do a movie, but, you also you also mentioned in an interview that actors get that you bring that up get lauded for applause and and Oscars for straight people playing gay people and it's somehow gay people playing straight people doesn't seem to get the same accolades. No, nobody. It's like it's like, and we do it so much better. Right. I think <laughs> Rock Hudson is much more of a believable heterosexual <laughs> than yes. uh, you know than, than somebody else. Anyway. <laughs> 
I forget who's out and who isn't. Right. I, I can't out people. Uh, <laughs> get them in trouble. Uh, but no, it's it's one of those funny things. Um, English actors come to America and they do American accents great. But American actors go to England and we never pull off their accents. And it's the same thing. Gay people play straight people great, but gay, but straight people don't play us very well. Uh, and we, and we, we pull it off very easily. Now and then they will. I mean, I, I loved a Brokeback Mountain. Right. Um, but those guys gave it their all. Um, and, and I, and I believed maybe because of the closetedness and all that, I believe that. But most of these performances, I look at them and I go, it's like, you can have a brilliant 20-year-old actress and she can have the best training ever and she can be the most naturally brilliant actress you've ever seen in your life. She cannot play a grandmother. Yeah. Life has not given her those lessons yet. Yeah. She doesn't understand the spilkis of it. She doesn't understand the pain. She doesn't have the life experience. Yeah. She doesn't know what it's like to wake up in the morning and have your back hurt. You just don't. And she can be willing to learn, but it's not the same as having lived it. Yeah. And I feel the same way. You you get these actors. Uh, I, was it Frank Langella who said, Every day they ask me, what was it like to play a homosexual? Nobody asked me what it was like to play a vampire. <laughs> a lot of people, they, but I kissed a boy and duh, they want to know about that. I, I had experience in, in casting. Probably the mo thing I'm most proud of in my advertising career as far as a piece of creative we did. In 1993, my agency, Deutsch, did the first commercial. That This is 93. Okay, so this is going where we showed two dudes shopping for furniture. They didn't talk about it. They were just two guys living together, and it was pure. They were gay, and it was created an incredible uproar. The, the amount of both love letters and hate letters that I got, but it was something I'm very proud because it didn't exist in them even in '93. That was this is not 100 years ago. It was not touched upon in 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 just about any media. You had Billy Crystal and soap. Uh, you had, but it still had not the gay lifestyle. And what I was so proud of is that. There was no stereotypes. It was just two guys. You wouldn't know they were even gay. I mean, it was, it was nothing about, and every portrayal of gays in the media up until that point had, gay. had, you had to be gay to be, to, uh, there was the, the, the gay. Let me, let me just, let me just uh, try and save you. Uh, yeah, before, <laughs> I, I, I you, fuck myself up all the time. Before you go down the cancel route, yes. let me try and save you. Um, what happened was, um, we were in the middle of this battle for, for equal rights, right? And one day I show up at the gay rights parade and there's a group of people by the by one of the fountains, marriage equality. I said, we are fighting for our lives with AIDS and we're fighting this and we and, and, and they're passing laws against us and they're throwing us out of, out of buildings and all. And you want a freaking wedding? That's what you care about? And then I stopped myself and I said, you know what? Look at them. They're younger people. They have chosen this as their battle. Maybe they know something you don't. Shut up and back them. Shut up and help them achieve what they want. Well, they turned out to be right. Marriage equality. There were a lot of straight people that could not understand homosexuality. Oh, my God, they're coming after my son. They're a bunch of pederasts. They're going to take right. my daughter. But they, but then you said marriage equality, and they went, "Oh, they want health insurance. Oh, I got. Oh, they want a mortgage. I understand that. Right. Oh, they want to be able to live together. I right. get that. Right. Oh, they want to have a credit card together. I understand that. So marriage equality opened up, just like you were saying with that ad of two people shopping for furniture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We may not, they may not understand a bunch of people going to Studio Fifty Four. But they understand I need a new couch because yeah. my cat peed on that one. Yeah. They understand real life. People understand real life. If you explain things to them in terms they understand, that's why, in a funny way, the what we were talking about before, the gender gap is hard. It's it's hard because most people never stop and ask themselves, am I a hundred percent male? Do I ever feel a little bit female? Is there any attraction to this at all? They never ask that. And so it's a harder question then. Do I need a new couch because the cat peed on that one? Yeah. That, that's an easier question. It's so funny that it, it's still, we still live with stereotypes. You, you brought up the thing, you know, is there anything? I'm somebody, I love decorating. Uh, I, I, I love flowers. I love, And the amount of jokes I get 
from my friends, from my straight friends, just, oh, you sure you're not gay? You sure you're not gay? I mean, it's just, it's incredible. And it, it just, I, I'm straight. And, but it's so interesting. You, you hear, and I wear tight t-shirts and I'm in a creative business and I've always gotten in, you know, the metrosexual thing. And then, but I've always heard from my buddies, are you sure you're not gay? I mean, you like decorating, you like flowers. It's incredible. I think it better friends. <laughs> <laughs> Let's I, talk. I'd ask them why they're so uptight about that. I, 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 it just, it's just, it's just incredible. I, I want a couple more anecdotes from the book because there's just so much in there. Um, the, the book is oh, I was so better great. last night. Talk to me about your lunch with Joan Rivers because I just love this story. So um, Joan and I well uh, knew each other. We were friends, and there were several projects that we talked about uh, doing together. Um, anyway, she called me to have lunch uh, to meet her. Uh, um, in the city to have lunch. And um, so I got in the car and I'm driving and I, and I get to my mailbox and I open my mailbox just to check and there's a package in there. And the package happened to be a very dear friend of mine, um, uh, Christopher, had passed away um, with AIDS and he had been cremated and he wanted his ashes. His family wanted his ashes with me. He wanted his ashes with me. So here in my mailbox, uh, Christopher's ashes. And I said, well, I can't leave them in the mailbox and go to lunch. So I, I put them in my bag. I took them along with me. So I go to lunch. We're sitting there and we're talking. And she's sitting there with the stupid little dog in her lap. And I think to myself, eh, you know, she's got the dog in her lap. I got Christopher on the floor here. I said, yeah, she'll understand. And I said, Joan, please excuse me, but um, I, I, my friend Christopher died. He got uh, cremated. I have his ashes with me. Would you mind if I put them on the table? And she said, not at all. Go ahead. And I go to take the ashes out. And she opens up her purse and she takes that little tin box. And she says, I never go anywhere without a little bit of Edgar. <laughs> Edgar was her husband. And she had and she had Edgar at lunch. So we sat there. Joan, the dog, me, Christopher, and Edgar. Two, and two, two Jews in their ashes. It's amazing. It's a great well, story. Jews never go anywhere without ashes. Um, <laughs> all right. Funny girl. Uh, 50 years later. Barbara Streisand obviously made that play, kind of launched her career. Uh, you've, you're writing the revised Funny Girl. Uh, Broadway is back. Uh, Beanie Feldstein okay. playing. Talk to me about Funny Girl and what, what, what we can expect. It's a lot of fun. You know, I, I, I revised the book, which means I didn't give you a whole new book show, I give you the best version of the show that I can. I want people to come in and see the funny girl they think was funny girl. Funny girl actually didn't work so good. It wasn't. That's why it hasn't been revived in 50 years. Right. Streisand's performance was what it was, so it made it a hit. Then the movie was better. They they worked on that script a lot and made it better, but the show itself, not so good. So they came to me seven years ago and said, would you revise the book? And I did. We did it in London. It was a big hit in London. Ran a year at the Savoy. Uh, went on tour for another year. Then we were supposed to bring it to America. COVID. So now we so now we're finally doing it, and it's been a lot of fun. Beanie is is a game. She is game. She is she is fearless. She's out there doing it. She's made the role her own. Is she Streisand? Of course she's not Streisand. Right. This is one Bob Streisand, but she's Beanie Feldstein, and she's created a character that is unique and different. And 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 I hopefully I have backed her up with the script uh, emotionally, and and that makes sense. And then that score, that unbelievable score. People, I'm the greatest star. Don't rain on my parade. Yeah, amazing, I, amazing. Songs. I, when the orchestra plays the overture. You go, Before wow. Up, yeah. And the whole audience applauds every song they hear. And they go, oh, I forgot that was in the show. Oh, yeah. I forgot that was. Yeah. And then the curtain goes up. I forgot that's that. where people came from. I mean, it's like you just, you, yeah. you, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. Exactly. You've and, been so generous and, with, you, with your time, Harvey. Before you go, I ask everybody the same question. This the show, the premise of the show is that kind of everybody and everything today is a brand. And so what's the Harvey, Harvey Firestein brand? Hopefully funny. Hopefully heartful, heartfelt and funny. Um, you know, I try very hard to be me where I need to be me. Um, and and to and and that's all you can do. And that's kind of a hard job sometimes. Yeah. yeah. But you know, like with the book, I wanted with the book, I wanted you to feel that you were sitting down with me and I was telling you the truth. Like 
And this is what happened, kids. I, I want everybody to rush out and get this book. I was better last night. It really is. You'll laugh. I you'll realize laugh. all that. Yes, because, because everybody comes I, backstage and you, 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 you're typical. I was better last night. You should have come here last night. Exactly. But also, I thought it would be the ultimate thing to put on a tombstone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who was it better last night when you're in the grave, right? Thanks for so, your time. Uh, I've been a big fan for years. It was so nice to get to meet you this way. Lovely to meet you. I watch you all the time. Thank you. We're trying to fight the good fight on TV, so we'll see. Thank you, brother. Bye. And that's it for this week's uh, episode of On Brand. I hope you enjoyed our interview with Harvey Firestein. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe anywhere you get podcasts, Apple or Spotify, anywhere. Please rate us, review us, subscribe, and also catch our videos on YouTube. You can also leave comments there and subscribe on YouTube. We love when, that, when you give us that engagement. We work hard here, and we love when you guys love what we do. So we'll see you next time on On Brand. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you like it, hit that subscribe button. And we love having you here watching On Brand. And just don't miss any future episodes. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.